welcome to this genealogy video. I'm Jenny Joyce and this, this time with this video we're going to do something a little bit different. We're not going to be looking at family history given what is going on in the world at the moment and how crazy everyone has been with hoarding toilet paper. I thought we'd have a little look at the history of toilet paper. Now toilet paper goes back further than you might think. In fact the use of paper for toilet purposes goes back to the 6th century in China when uh, a scholar official wrote about it. Paper on which there are quotations or commentaries from the five classics or the names of sages I dare not use for toilet purposes. Obviously there is some paper that he does dare to use for toilet paper, just not that kind. A few years after that, or a couple of centuries after that, in 851, an Arab traveller remarked, they do not wash themselves with water when they have done their necessities, but they only wipe themselves with paper. Obviously, using paper at that stage was an unusual thing. By the 14th century, packages of toilet paper were being mass produced in China, and some of them were even perfumed, especially those that were used by the Chinese emperors. As I said, this was a bit unusual. In other places, people were doing different things. In ancient Rome, the wealthy used wool or wool and rose water, but most others used a sponge on a stick in their communal uh, latrines, like we can see there. And then they placed, placed the uh, sponge on the stick back in a pail of vinegar or salt water. Other cultures, well, the Greeks used clay I don't even want to think about whether how they used it, whether it was wet or dry. The Vikings used wool and Eskimos used moss or snow, depending on the season. In Japan, in the Nara period, which is 710 to 785, they were using sticks for their cleansing, special cleansing sticks. And you can see some pictures of them there with some pictures of some modern toilet paper rolls just for size comparison. Um, doesn't look like what I'd like to be using. We know that from several Talmudic sources that ancient Jewish people often used small pebbles, often carried in a special bag, or they might use dry glass, grass or the smooth edges of both broken pottery jugs. Nowadays, tearing of the perforated toilet paper we have is considered work and therefore not allowed on the Sabbath. So the toilet paper must be pre-torn beforehand. Speaking of the use of pebbles, the early uh, Muslims were allowed to use pebbles for the same purpose, so long as it was an odd number of pebbles. Everywhere else, people were using, if they were rich, wool, lace, hemp, not sure how effective lace would be. And less wealthy people would use their hands to uh, clean up uh, in rivers, after using rivers, or they might use rags, wood shavings, leaves, grass, hay, stones, sand, moss, water, snow, ferns, plant husks, fruit skins, seashells, or corn cobs, depending on what country they were in, and the weather conditions and social conditions. Use of paper in the West, we don't know exactly when it started, but by the time of the dissolution of the monasteries in England in the 16th century, it was certainly obviously possible to use, that people were using paper for that purpose, because John Bale wrote in 1549, a great number of them which purchased those superstitious mansions reserved of those library books, some to serve their jakes, some to scour their candlesticks, and some to rub their boots. Now, jakes is an old slang word for toilet, and it actually evolved into currently the, the phrase, the john, that some people use. By the 16th century, a French satirical writer wrote about a character who goes out trying to find out which is the best way to cleanse yourself after having pooped. Um, he dismisses the use of paper as ineffective. 
uh, and he says, who shall his foul tail with paper wipes shall at his bullocks leave some chips? And he concludes that the neck of a goose that is well downed provides optimum cleaning medium. I don't think many people could afford to use the neck of a goose, wouldn't have had it around at that time. But there we go. Uh, interesting that he's talking about some chips being left because later splinters in toilet paper was a real problem. So with more publishing in the 18th century, there were newspapers and cheap editions of popular books, penny dreadful sometimes, and those were often used for the cleansing purposes. The Northampton Mercury in 9 July 1722 had a bitter attack on a rival newspaper that had just opened up and he described that first newspaper as being his first parcel of bum fodder. Lord Chesterfield, in a letter to his son in 14, uh, 1747, told of a man who purchased a common edition of Horace, of which he tore off gradually a couple of pages, carried them with him to that necessary place, read them first, and then set them down as a sacrifice to Cloacina. Thus was so much time fairly gained. So you're sort of reading the book and using it in tandem. Hmm. However, toilet paper as we know it now is generally credited with being invented by Joseph Gaiety from the US. He first marketed it in 1857 um, and it, he was selling it as an anti-hemorrhoid pro, uh, product. There were packets of flat sheets and they were watermarked with his name, JC Gaiety, NY for New York. Uh, and the original product contained aloe as a lubricant. By 1859, he was selling a thousand sheets for one dollar. And it, and you can see here, we've got an ad for it. It was one of the few commercially available toilet papers in the US until 1890. His advertisement called it the greatest necessity of the age and warned against the perils of using papers printed with toxic inks on sensitive body parts. And he blamed those toxic inks for hemorrhoids. And his medicated paper was still available as late as the 1920s. Things moved along after 1871, when Seth Wheeler from Albany, New York, or Albany, I'm not sure, patented a roll of perforated paper. This wasn't toilet paper, but it was the process of perforating paper on a roll became an important step towards toilet paper. In 1883, Seth Wheeler, the same, made an agreement with James E. Lawson so that James Lawson could use his perforation process. Lawson was an Englishman and this allowed the formation of the British Patent Perforated Paper Company Limited. It was one of the first probably the first company to manufacture a continuous and perforated toilet paper, which it did from 1883. A roll of a thousand sheets sold for a shilling. And we can see here some ads that I've found in newspapers. The top one is from 1883, or they're both from 1883, from two different British newspapers. And you can quite clearly see from the illustration that it's perforated paper on a roll such as we are familiar with nowadays. Now the British Patent Perforated Paper Company was sold by order of court in 1889 and bought by a Walter James Alcock. There are many, many, many books and websites who are obviously all just copying each other because they use almost identical words. And they say that Walter Alcock from Britain patented or invented a perforated roll in 1879. There is no such patent uh, uh, granted anywhere. I've checked all the patents and he had nothing to do with this company at this stage. So like other things on the internet, and I know this will surprise you, but some things on the internet, many things even, are untrue. In 1893, Alcock did lodge a patent for an improved holder of or 
bracket for paper rolls and he cooperated he did a lodge that together with Seth Wheeler who you will remember uh, lodged his patent for perforated paper in 1871. So just to quickly reiterate by 1883, the British Patent Perforated Paper Company Limited was making rolls of toilet paper and Walter James Alcock did not purchase that company until 1889. So the credit that the internet is giving him for being an early inventor of toilet paper is completely unfounded. Now, I've mentioned Seth Wheeler a couple of times. He's an interesting character, apart from his roll of paper. Originally he was just thinking that for regular paper. He did lodge several patents in 1891 for wrapping or toilet paper as he called it. It was had partly separated sheets to avoid wastage on in this particular one. So the implication when you read through the actual patent application is that earlier rolls tend to lead to too many sheets being accidentally pulled down and a lot of wastage on paper by partially um, separating these pages, he claimed that this was a superior process. Three years later, he patented another, put another patent through for a composite roll, sort of three together, which you can see, and they roll simultaneously, but you only take one sheet at the minute, at the, at the time. So in this first case, you'd take it from the middle of the roll and then the, the one on the left and then the one on the right and so on. It looks a bit strange. Just because he lodged a patent for it doesn't mean it was ever manufactured. In fact, he lodged a lot of patents relating to toilet paper. He seems to have been a little bit obsessed with the subject. Here we've got one with a patterned paper. It's kind of like what we do have now with the embossed papers. And another one with some strange shapes and of pieces of toilet paper. This is an even stranger one with, uh, what is it, hexagonal um, sheets or alternating different shaped sheets. It's a little bit obsessed. He also lodged several applications, appli patent applications for different toilet roll holders, but he wasn't the only one. He was by far and away the most prolific lodger of patents relating to toilet paper and toilet paper holders, but he wasn't the only one. We can see on the left one from 1885, where it's going to, the holder is going to help with its dispensing. In the middle, we can see sheets coming out of a box and another one with a very strange looking holder. I'm not quite sure what that was supposed to achieve. And that later was from 1888. Uh, here we have numerous other ones showing perforations. We have various uh, holders and ways of either sheets or rolls being dispensed. It's something that obviously has obsessed a number of people for a long time. And it was inevitable that somebody would see the advertising possibilities. So in 1910, a patent was lodged for a toilet paper holder that could be used to put in ads to display to a captive audience. Now, the names that are most commonly associated with toilet paper in, or toilet paper as we know it now, in the States are Scott Brothers. Scott Paper was founded in Philadelphia in 1879 and there are claims everywhere, including on various websites from the company that took them over, that they were the first people to sell, sell um, toilet paper on a roll and that they did it in 1890. Well, as we have seen already, it was being sold in, by 1883 in England. It may have been the first people to sell it in the US, but they weren't the first full stop. Now, you might think, oh great, wonderful, this is going to be so much better than just having to tear off pages of books. And you would imagine, you might imagine that people would buy this in great amounts, but they didn't initially. They were very reluctant to buy it. They were embarrassed. They didn't want to be seen asking for something so personal. And besides which, 
for free, they could use their old newspaper or their Sears Roebuck catalogue. And those were commonly used for a long time in the States. So Scott Brothers had to devise unique strategies to get druggists and consumers to purchase it. These went from all the way to making particular personalised um, paper packaging for that particular druggist. But from the 20th century, they started selling it in supermarkets. This is when things really started changing. And they were the first to advertise toilet paper on TV in 1955. They still, they continued for many, many years selling brands, well-known brands like Scott Tissue and Cottonelle, and they were acquired by the Kimberly Clark Corporation in 1995, which is still going today. Another well-known uh, kind of toilet paper in the US was Bromo paper. As you can see, it came in a box with sheets. Uh, the, the box was opened at the top, so you could just pull out one sheet as, as required, and every sheet had a watermark of Bromo, so that you could be sure that it wasn't a counterfeit because the counterfeits wouldn't have had that. And meanwhile, in Britain, in the 1890s, John Miller Limited from Glasgow made something called silkeen toilet paper. These were sheets hung on a wire. They had a rippled texture. And this copy, which survives in the Wellcome Library collection, may have been an advertising sales sample because of the information on it about the uh, sizes, etc., etc. That same company also made Globus, Excelsior, and Purolette. Uh, Globus and Purolette were described as single sheets of hard paper in the Wellcome Catalogue collection, and they're described as feeling like grease proof paper. Um, the Excelsior roll was on a roll dot in single sheets. Another well-known British company in this business was Eisel. And it started because Chambers & Co had found Eis or developed Eisel disinfectant made from distilled coal tar. They'd been in the coal mining business. And it was well known for that. And then it became known for its use on medicated toilet paper. It was for many years often found in schools and public lavatories, and it was noted for its abrasive quality. The reason for its popularity, local authorities were given it, given it as part of a bulk purchasing agreement when ordering disinfectant. You order this much disinfectant with us, from us, and we'll throw in the toilet paper. Eisel toilet paper did come in rolls, but more often it was interleaved sheets pulled from a dispenser. About now you might be starting to have some memories come back of time at school, because I certainly was when I read about that. Things that I'd long forgotten and wish I still could forget. And it was like using tracing paper. Bronco was another British brand that was made in London from 1935 rough on one side, smooth, shiny on the other, and seemingly non-absorbent. And it continued to be sell, sold until 1989. Bronco also got some government contracts, and for them, the sheets were stamped government property. I don't know if that meant the government wanted you back after you'd finished with it. Now, in 1956, Eisel decided to have a survey, get a consumer research company in and find out whether people wanted soft, unmedicated toilet paper. This company did more than 400 interviews and they, re they reported back that the market was softening up, but faster in some places than others. In Glasgow, many people still preferred to use newspaper. In Yorkshire, Soft papers were viewed with great distrust and anxiety because they were not reliable. They might break or tear. And people literally turned up their noses at the smell of Eisel. I've never smelled Eisel. I didn't grow up in the UK. But I can just imagine some ghastly, horrible disinfectant smell through the paper. Now, Americans already had decided that they liked soft toilet paper, but the Brits thought the Americans were extravagant 
and prone to crazes that would soon pass. In 1970, 1970, the British Civil Service decided that they'd think about whether they might adopt soft toilet paper. Now, the annual bill for that toilet paper would increase from £370,000 to a million pounds a year if they switched to soft toilet paper. So it would need to impress. So the Civil Service's Chief, Chief Medical Officer asked Sir Graham Wilson to investigate whether this soft toilet paper was up to the job. He went to remarkable lengths to compare toilet papers, studied them under the microscope, tested their absorbency and everything. Apparently hard toilet paper takes two hours to absorb one drop of water. He even, and this is going to be a bit gross, so I apologise in advance, he even co conducted a porosity test. He pressed the third finger of his right hand onto paper with a stool sample underneath, then pressed his finger on a petri dish, trying to see whether germs had gotten through and whether his finger was contaminated. His report back explained that with soft paper, people's fingers would be virtually in contact with the faecal material. So, and this is amazing, this is 1970, remember? Until the routine washing of hands after defecation becomes a universal practice, soft toilet tissue simply pose too great risk to health. But therefore, it wasn't used, it wasn't adopted, and that's why so many people today remember that hard toilet paper, either in uh, rolls or more often sheets, from institutions like schools and public toilets. Now, soft paper had been available in Britain since 1907, but people just weren't picking it up. Even in, eight, sorry, that should be 1932, refugees from Hitler's Germany set up a mill producing crepe paper, that's soft toilet paper in Walthamstow. But still, soft toilet paper did not take off for a long time. Now, everything that we've been told, talking about to now, as far as toilet paper, the paper toilet paper, has been single ply. Two ply paper was first made in 1947, sorry, 1942, by St Andrew Mill Limited in London. Initially, they made it as a disposable gentleman's handkerchief and it was sold exclusively at Harrods, you know, like a, a face tissue. Uh, obviously, people decided it had another potential use. And so the company began, began marketing it as the ultimate in comfort and they named it Andrex after the St Andrew Mill. It was became very popular from 1961 when Hollywood stars started demanding the soft toilet paper instead of old hard stuff. Now, Andrex is still big in England and it's been marketed in other com company, countries as Kleenex Cottonelle, Scottex, Haeckel, Baby Soft. Maybe you know it under one of those names or something else. It's also been synonymous with the little Labrador puppy since 1972. So even though the civil servants couldn't accept tof, soft toilet paper, British householders did. And this ad says, if you can't read it, compared to the Americans, British, the British have had it tough. British housewives want a soft option. And Andrex was certainly providing that for them. So far I've only talked about in modern times, the US and the UK. What about Australia? After all, that's where I'm from. Now, although toilet paper had been invented in 1857, it was not used in Australia for many decades after that. And it really didn't take off big until sewers start, houses started being attracted, attached to the sewer because then chucking down wads of newspaper was not good. And before that, before people were connected to the sewers, they could use anything, newspapers, Anthony Horden's catalogue, etc. The Americans may have used the Sears Roebuck catalogue, Australians used the Anthony Horden's catalogue. But that said, toilet paper was available in Australia as at least as early as 1873. 
that's before the perforated. The ad I've got just says that I found from the Queen Bee and Age says five sheet or five for one shilling. I presume that's five sheets, and so I assume that is single sheets of paper, not five rolls. Uh, in that case, that sounds quite excessive, a shilling. 1889, we also have an ad from Newcastle Morning Herald and Miners Advocate, where it is advertising for sale toilet paper in rolls perforated. This is 1889, it's before that 1890 date that Scott Brothers supposedly started selling the first perforated rolls of toilet paper. Now, these are some of the early rolls that were available in Australia. They look worse than I can remember anything. They look stiffer than um, baking paper. They look most unpleasant. However, that's what there was at that stage. It was probably still an improvement on having to go out down the backyard to the dunny or the thunderbox, the outhouse perhaps if you were a bit more genteel, you might call it that, and you'd have your bits of cut up newspaper held up by a string or on a hook of a bit of metal beside the uh, what was probably either a, a long drop cesspit or maybe have a pan under it for your use. Now something had to be done if these if we had these kind of toilets that weren't connected to the sewerage somehow they had to be emptied and we had the night soil man who about once a week dunny men as people colloquially called them came to remove full sanitary pans dunny pans and replace with an empty one in case it isn't being clear to any of my overseas friends dunny is an australian name for the toilet. It isn't perhaps a word that everybody would use, but it is commonplace and it's one that everybody would understand. So the full pan would be taken out to the dunny cart and later emptied straight into the sewers, which led to the ocean outfalls, outfalls. And these continued in some Sydney suburbs as late as the 60s, possibly even later. Now, many Sydney suburbs still have narrow lanes sort of at the backs of houses between streets, which get called dunny lanes. Uh, they were for the dunny cart to go in at night and empty the pans. Australia's first soft absorbent toilet paper was sorbent. It was originally only one, one ply and it was available from 18, sorry, 1953 but by 1958, it was being sold as two-ply paper. It was called soft and strong. Um, before sorbent was available in Australia, it was toilet paper was kept under the counter at pharmacies and news agents as something unsavoury. Interestingly, the name sorbent comes from the fact that it's absorbent. We also around the world had specialist toilet papers. There was a phase for getting all sorts of different colours of toilet paper to match your bathroom or match or complement your bathroom decor. You know, they might have been in pinks or aqua, yellow, light blue, pale green. I can also remember toilet paper with patterns, maybe little dogs or something printed on it. Now we've pretty well, that's all pretty well stopped except for maybe some novelty things that you might get uh, and we're back to white toilet paper although we often have it in uh, pattern embossed into it now we also now see that the toilet paper may be infused with shea butter or aloe vera and in comparison to those days when it was only one ply we can now get up to four ply toilet paper here's a little fun fact during world war ii british soldiers were given a ration of three sheets of toilet paper per day American soldiers got 22 sheets per day. Does that seem fair? Now, the most recent advancement, if you like, in toilet paper is wet wipes. Uh, they were developed by Andrex, the UK company, 
in the 1990s. Uh, you may not know them. They're described as being flushable. Don't believe it. They're not because they don't break down in the water. So they can lead to terrible pipe blockages and fat birds. Yes, there are such a thing as fat birds. Material that shouldn't be down the drain gets coalesced with cooking fat that shouldn't be down the drain, making horrific bowel blockages in drains. So Sydney Water had a little slogan, keep the wipes out of the pipes. Now, this is not the first shortage of toilet paper we've had, no. In 1950, at the time of the Korean War, a US firm decided to start doing using lie detectors to ask their employees whether they'd been taking anything that didn't belong to them. Two out of three of the employees failed the test. Now, what the company was actually trying to find out was whether there were any thefts of secret government items. But these employees, it turned out, had been stealing toilet paper because there was a shortage of it at the time. The following year in Australia, there were toilet shortages of a number of things, but toilet paper was one of them, those things. And I love the fact that one of the newspaper's headlines was hoarders blamed for shortages, which is something that we can sympathise with these days. Some grocers even rationed items like sugar, matches, toilet paper, etc. And in 1973, Johnny Carson from America's The Tonight Show gave a monologue and he made some comments about, or his monologue was about comments made by a Wisconsin congressman about the possibility of a toilet paper shortage. Now, Carson was only joking about this, but subsequently consumers in the US purchased abnormal amounts of toilet paper, causing an actual shortage for several months. Which brings us to where we are now. This is a photograph last night of my local corner supermarket. Those empty shelves are the toilet paper shelves. You might also be able to see that paper towels are rationed to one pack per person, but there's none of those left either. Everyone's going mad. Toilet paper doesn't cure the coronavirus, but everybody seems to think that it's essential. And I just hope that getting this lighthearted look at the history of toilet paper has maybe brought a smile to your face at this rather depressing times that we're going through. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, below the page where it's shown, you'll be able to sign up to go into a mailing list to receive information when there are more presentations like this available. Do sign up or do send me any comments. Thank you.